everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. We're in Taiwan where we venture outside to film things. That's always a nice change of pace. Uh, so some updates on the hardware industry calling in sick for the last couple, or well, for the last week or so. AMD getting its own side channel vulnerabilities to follow suit in the newest trend set by Intel over the last couple of years. NVIDIA moving to some new TSMC process. And we'll also be talking about dual axial coolers for AMD RDNA 2 GPUs and ISPs proving their benevolence by removing the data caps because they definitely needed them there in the first place. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's Tough RAM RGB memory, available from 3000 megahertz up to 4400 megahertz in eight gigabyte by two configurations. The Thermaltake Tough RAM uses 10 addressable RGB LEDs for bright illumination and comes in both black and white kits of memory. Learn more at the link in the description below. Over the past week or so of hardware factory tours, we've learned a couple of things about the human malware situation. Unfortunately, you're gonna have to bear with me using that phrasing, but uh, one of the main things is that a couple of the companies have enacted policies, mostly in the US, relating to how workers come to work. So some of the hardware companies, including Intel, Dell, and AMD, are now, as the biggest ones, are now recommending that their employees telecommute or just call in for, phone, for meetings uh, via phone conference. The ones that still have people working on site, a lot of the companies have switched to AB workdays. That's a couple places here in Taiwan are doing that as well, but it's a lot less prevalent. Taiwan seems to have things pretty under control. And there's only a couple companies that have had any impact from the human malware situation on at least our end of the visit. But for what's going on in the US, AB workdays are set up where people are now alternating to keep the office about half empty. Some of the other companies that we work with or that you buy from in the industry, including case and cooler companies, are struggling with the fairness of what they're doing. So uh, a couple of the ones we've worked with here have decided that at home in the US, they're going to have their employees work from home and call in but then the warehouse workers still need to go to the warehouse and ship stuff. So that's been a sticking point for a lot of them. The US seems to be most heavily impacted right now in terms of hardware, computer hardware companies changing their working schedules. Obviously in parts of Europe, uh, assuredly the warehouse schedules have been shuffled. As for locally here in Taiwan, the situation that we can tell you from firsthand experience is that for the most part, things are operating normally. There's a couple places like EVGA where they've mostly shut their doors to everybody, including their delivery people. Uh, and then most of the other factories, they vary from it's nothing's changed to any foreign visitors need to wear a mask. And that's about as far as it gets for the most part. So EVJ has shut its doors. Uh, we spoke with EVJ CEO and with their PR rep, and they currently have restricted access to only one door in the building to get in and out. They take employee temperatures multiple times per day. They're requiring masks at the company, and they've also banned entry of all visitors, including the delivery agents. The longer term impact uh, to the industry is that design and, design and manufacturing will slow down, obviously, over the next couple of weeks. And it looks like Computex is questionable for happening at this point. So we'll, we'll see if that happens. Most likely it'll get pushed back, kind of like what happened a long time ago during the other human malware uh, pandemic. I'm sure I can't say that one on YouTube either. So during our factory tours, we've learned that the raw materials factories are seeing the highest order volume in Taiwan uh, versus the other factories here because they're the ones making the supply and the companies can't get it from the sources in China anymore, so they're getting it locally instead. Next news item is AMD's side channel vulnerabilities. So researchers with the Graz University of Technology released a pretty big white paper detailing two new side channel attacks known collectively as take away attacks. Specifically, the two attacks are collide and probe and load and reload. Those are two separate groups of attacks. Both attacks are similar in nature as they both prey on the L1D cache way predictor in AMD CPUs dating as far back as 2011. And according to the white paper, every AMD CPU from 2011 to 2019 is affected. So that would mean AMD's most recent Zen 2 based CPUs are included in that list. While we've been conditioned at this point to see new vulnerabilities from Intel on basically a weekly basis, it's more notable when we see something with AMD. That's not to say AMD has completely avoided vulnerabilities. They did have issues with Spectre, for example, although not all of the variants of Spectre, but not nearly to the extent 
uh, that Intel has suffered, has AMD suffered. These new attacks appear to be Spectre-based in nature, according to the paper. That may be why AMD stated it didn't believe the attacks to be new and that existing mitigations were sufficient. The researchers refute AMD's claim and contest the status of the vulnerabilities. And there's additional research from Tom's hardware on this. If you want to read up on it, it'll be in our show notes. At any rate, according to the paper, it says, quote, with Collide and Probe, an attacker can monitor a victim's memory accesses without knowledge of physical addresses or shared memory when time sharing a logical core. With a load and reload, we exploit the way predictor to obtain highly accurate memory access traces of victims on the same physical core. While load and reload relies on shared memory, it does not invalidate the cache line, allowing stealthier attacks that do not include any last level cache evictions." End quote on that. So as with the other side channel attacks, a potential attacker can fish out sensitive and protected data and even AES encryption keys from areas of the CPU that are not normally accessible. While AMD hasn't indicated that there is or that there will be a specific mitigation for this uh, apparently new attack, despite what AMD says, AMD's security advisory on its website recommends a couple of pretty obvious things. One, keep your operating system up to date by operating at the latest version of the platform software and firmware, which include existing mitigations for speculation-based vulnerabilities. Of course, this says nothing of other software on the system, like all the RGB software, which is also riddled with vulnerabilities, but the OS, I guess, is one thing. Following secure coding methodologies was a recommendation, <laughs> uh, rather wide net. Implementing the latest patched versions of critical libraries, including those susceptible to side channel attacks. And then finally, utilizing safe computer practices and running antivirus software, probably not including Norton. So we'll keep an eye on this one as it develops. AMD is obviously not invulnerable to uh, attacks of its own. It's just that the CPUs haven't been out quite as long. So it'll take a while to figure out what happens and how the Zen architecture responds to different at attempts at exploitation. But for now, this is the one to keep an eye on. NVIDIA reportedly using TSMC's uh, COAS, we'll call it, in a new report coming from Digitimes. This suggests that NVIDIA is on the short list of customers who could be using TSMC's chip on wafer on substrate or CWOS, C God damn it, or COWOS. And this is packaging for upcoming GPUs. TSMC's COAS is a 2.5D packaging technology that packages multiple dyes together at the wafer level on an interposer, something that TSMC calls, quote, wafer integration. TSMC's process has evolved to be able to target chips that far exceed the reticle limit up to 2x the reticle limit. TSMC and Broadcom recently illustrated this with the first 2x reticle limit interposer that will end up being used by Broadcom and HPC deployment. And TSMC does this by essentially stitching interposers together at the wafer level and interconnecting them. The benefits of this approach are improved interconnect performance and bandwidth, improved transistor density, and higher memory capacity. TSMC's current generation of uh, COWOS currently supports up to six stacks of HBM for its memory solution. As for what NVIDIA would be targeting with TSMC's current solution is unknown. However, it's worth noting that NVIDIA has used TSMC COAS packaging before on Pascal and on Volta-based professional solutions. It's likely that NVIDIA would be leveraging TSMC's technology again for upcoming Titan, Tesla, or potentially Quadro products, presumably based on Ampere, but we'll see. AMD shifting to dual axial coolers for RDNA 2 GPUs. This, at the time of filming our last news episode, it had uh, shortly come out right after that. So it's a bit old now, it's about a week old news, but still worth talking about. After Andy's Financial Analyst Day, users on Reddit sifted through the slide deck for the presentation and noticed a picture on a slide that depicted a Radeon GPU sans the blower style cooler. After a bit of speculation via the linked Reddit thread in our show notes document, Scott Herkelman, the vice president and general manager of Radeon, and also the guy who said that you were all jabated, uh, even though that definitely was not planned, commented to confirm the suspicion that there will be no blower coolers with RDNA 2 GPUs. This is particularly amusing to us because Herkelman is also the one who posted publicly and seemed extremely confused as to why we and every other media outlet worth anything said that the blower coolers were garbage. He seemed at the time, about a year ago now, to insist that they were just fine. But either way, I guess we just didn't get it. 
and AMD is only now changing it. So, uh, quote, there will be no blower reference fans for gamers on next gen. So you're correct, Herkelman said in the comments. Uh, Herkelman expanded on this comment a bit further by saying that, quote, our AIBs may choose to do a blower design on any of the next gen GPUs. However, the majority of feedback we received from the community at launch of the 5700 XT on AMD reference designs has guided us towards dual and triaxial designs. He says, I am excited for you all to see them when the time is right. Just like he was excited to say that we were all wrong when we didn't like it the first time. Uh, most would agree that it's past time for AMD to ditch the blower coolers for its reference designs. This is a move that Nvidia made across the stack for the 20 series, although it made sparingly for cards in the past before that. While blower style coolers have a place in specific setups, it's generally better to just let the board partners make the cheap models of the cards with blowers for people who specifically want them rather than making it the blanket baseline design. They've never been particularly effective, especially in recent years with Vega and Navi with the power consumption going up. Intel is still sore about that antitrust lawsuit from a long time ago. It's apparently not done fighting a fine that was delivered about 10 years ago when the European Commission laid a 1.2 billion US dollar fine at Intel's feet for what was deemed to be illegal behavior for anti-competitive practices. According to Intel, the commission, quote, got it wrong. I'll remember that legal argument in case I ever need it. Quote, the commission either took a wrong approach in its decision or it carried out an as efficient competitor, AEC test, and it got it wrong, says Daniel Beard from Intel's legal department. The fight stems from practices Intel engaged in back in 2009 by offering steep rebates to OEMs for buying Intel chips. So this in itself is not too uncommon the rebate side of things anyway. Uh, AMD also does this. There's something called Marketing Development Fund or MDF that most of the companies pass around. It's basically money in exchange for doing something normally not illegal. So the AMD, for example, in the past has offered MDF for SIs or system integrators to include its GPUs and systems that were built. The key difference where Intel really, uh, to use its own words, got it wrong is that Intel also uh, offered money to prevent the SIs or the OEMs from using the competing CPUs. So Intel previously was found to have paid the OEMs to exclusively use Intel chips. This is the practice that was deemed illegal as an attempt to shut AMD out of the x86 market. And that's the key difference. MDF's pretty normal. All the companies do it to some extent. Whether or not it's a good thing is suspect, but that's the way the industry works. Paying to not use a competitor, that's where the problems legally start to emerge. Intel paid what was at the time a record fine for its actions. Intel contested that fine ever since, filing an appeal that was rejected in 2014. In 2017, however, the EU Court of Justice agreed to rehear the case. According to reports, though, a decision is likely to come next year. So we'll see what happens. ISPs suspend data caps, proving that they never really did have a congestion problem. As many are preparing to work and study from home due to the virulent human side channel attacks, ISPs in a rare display of charitability or a cheap play for good press are suspending broadband data caps. AT&T confirmed to Motherboard that it was suspending all data usage caps until further notice. Now, these don't apply to everyone and where we live anyway, they don't apply to us, but if you're not familiar with it, the basics are that some of the ISPs do actually have a data limitation typically per month that you can't exceed or they'll either throttle you or charge you enough to remortgage your house. Likewise, Comcast and T-Mobile have announced similar efforts here. Comcast stated it would not charge any overage fees, while T-Mobile has temporarily removed all usage caps. Verizon asserts that it doesn't place any usage fees on its broadband services and is instead bumping its speeds from 100 megabits per second to 200 megabits per second for some plans. Some ISPs are temporarily suspending late fees and disconnection fees in addition to these changes. So surely ISPs are remaining vigilant in avoiding Verizon's colossal PR dumpster fire of firefighters getting throttled when they were trying to combat rampant wildfires. The fact that the ISPs can at will lift the data caps and increase the speeds shows how arbitrary these uh, restrictions are though. These policies in the first place are obviously here to make money and not because that uh, there's some traffic limitation on a fiber optic cable on which light is transmitted one way and then the other. 
So ISPs would have customers believe that data usage caps help manage traffic congestion, but these practices exist purely as a very thinly veiled cash grab on captive customers who, in most cases, can't get another option. They don't have competitive options on the market. But don't take our word for it. In the coming months, as hordes of users work, study, and play from home in an attempt to increase the chance of us getting demonetized from talking about human malware, we can see how many ISPs speak up and say that their networks couldn't handle the surge in traffic. Let's see how many congestion and overage problems these data caps would have really saved us from. Finally, Folding at Home and NVIDIA are calling for help with human malware related projects that users can donate CPU and GPU resources to. Uh, Folding at Home is basically a software you can run on your system to use idle time to spin up your GPU or CPU to process folding proteins. According to the Folding at Home blog, all of the projects are GPU accelerated thanks to OpenMM. The jobs that users can help fold are, we can't, well, we can't name a lot of them thanks to YouTube, but the numbers are 11741, which is apparently a receptor binding domain and complex uh, with human receptor ACE2. There's 11746, which is another one for ACE2. Uh, 11742, which says it's a protease in complex with an inhibitor. I don't know what any of this stuff means. 11743 uh, says that it's a protease potential drug target. 11744 says that it's a receptor binding domain trapped by a human malware S230 antibody. And then finally, there's one 11745, if you wanna know the specific numbers, that's what they are, which says it's a receptor binding domain mutated to the human malware uh, causing virus trapped by a previous human malware from about a decade ago, antibody. Anyway, PC Master Race and Hot Hardware are contributing. They've set up teams. They're encouraging users to join. This is something that I potentially could see some fun getting into as well, uh, if only as an excuse to do some LN2 overclocking on a stream and see how quickly we can blow past the points that were created by some of our competitors by putting something like a 3990X or Tesla's under LN2. So we might get involved, but we have to go home first to do that. Uh, otherwise, we could maybe borrow High Cookies Lab, and we'll have footage from that coming up soon. So subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.cameronsnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash cameronsnexus. Thanks for watching. Things have been pretty good here, so you don't need to worry about us. But uh, going back home, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. It does sound like the hardware industry is mostly called in sick in the U.S., though, uh, for the next couple of weeks. Everyone's telecommuting. But that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.